Welcome to your time management revolution. This is time management fixer Helene Sugura. In today's episode, I'll be sharing a previously recorded interview during which we're discussing time management and mind management. Enjoy. When you wake up in the morning, are you raring to go? Or do you think to yourself, what could possibly be the point? Doing What Works will help you see it isn't too late to go after your dreams. We talk with experts about everything from getting in shape to finding work you love. We're your guide to a better life. Now, here's your host for Doing What Works, Maureen Anderson. Do you have enough time to do the things you want to do? I bet it doesn't feel like it. By the end of this hour of the show, I hope it will. I hope we will have given you the tools to wrangle your time in a way that leaves you feeling like you have enough of it. I would like to dedicate this program to my husband and producer, Daryl Anderson, who taught me the magic of keeping your butt in the chair. Honey, thank you again for that. Well, <laughs> shucks. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, you know, I do. I, I suddenly realize it isn't magic. You're not on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's another show, honey. <laughs> but without Twitter, I would not have all this chaos in my brain that I would like to think is inspiring new connections in that brain. It's debatable, I realize. Without Twitter, you would have about eight additional hours of life in your day. To do other things, but I'm just saying. But would I enjoy it? I, I, don't I know. can't resist sharing an observation I know I've shared on this show before, but Twitter is for people who don't live in New York and wish they did. I just need a little bit of chaos, I think. Anyway, anyway, I need a little bit of chaos, but if I'm honest, I'm also not producing what you and I know I should be producing for. The stage of my life, the time I have available, and the things I have at my disposal. So I am just as eager as I hope everyone else is to hear from Helene Segura. She is a time management consultant, productivity coach to a wide range of professionals, and president of the International Board of Certification for Professional Organizers. Her book is The Inefficiency Assassin. How's that for a title? Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter not longer. Thanks for being with us, Celine. Thank you, Maureen. I'm glad to be here. You watched your dad struggle to find time for everything. Yes. And that made, obviously, a, a huge impression on me because watching my dad struggle and then watching my parents get into arguments over the time that he was spending at work and working late hours along with the rest of his colleagues there, uh, and that's something that I did not want to go through when I was an adult. So I've always been very aware of time and what you need to use it for. I wonder if that isn't the norm, though. People arguing about work commanding too much time. I have come across quite a few people when they have relationship issues either in their personal life or in their work life it's either because there hasn't been an expectation set about where time needs to go and things aren't being said and they don't talk to each other directly and so a lot of things get misinterpreted or it's the opposite. They're yelling at each other. Where's your time going? And so time can actually be a huge argument or disagreement between people a lot like money can if you're not expressing your feelings and your thoughts about it openly. I'll never forget sharing with a guy we've had on the show before, Larry Nettles. I used to work with him at AT AT&T, and I'm the oldest of eight children born in nine years. And I was telling Larry how not enchanted my dad was with his accounting work. And Larry was like, are you nuts? All those kids, your dad gets to work and goes, ah. (laughs) (laughs) Because work can be an escape from a less than ideal home life, of course. 
Yes, and that's actually something that I talk about in one of my chapters with some of the quote-unquote workaholics that I work with. They don't necessarily enjoy staying at work the whole time, but they may be trying to avoid a less than desirable situation at home, and so that's why they're taking their time to get home. For example, my first job out of college, I was working a lot of long hours, and I was the only one there who was in a committed relationship. I was the only female working in a sales trainee program, and the rest of the guys there were either single or they did not like their girlfriends, and they were never in a hurry to get home. And the thing was, we all had to stay until all the work was done. I was the only one finishing, and the rest of the guys were lollygagging because they didn't care whether or not they went home. They were trying to avoid what was there. So, obviously, I did not stay in that job for very long. Well, it strikes me that workaholics, I mean, that is the only word that ends in a holic that can be considered virtuous to some people. Ah, yes. You have a really good point there. And a workaholic can be great if that is your desire and that's the life that you want to live. It only becomes a negative when that's not the life you want to live. That work does get in the way of special moments that you do want to have outside of your career. I hope this isn't too personal, but did your parents ever work it out? Oh, yes, they did. My dad did spend quite a few nights on the couch, and they did work <laughs> things out. But it, it was probably throughout my entire elementary school years that they were arguing about time. And finally, in middle school, there was some change in supervisors and, and change in how they were doing things at work. And he was able to start getting home in time to go to our practices and to our games. But, you know, five or six years, that's a, a long time to go with having stress in your marriage. It strikes me, too, what the career coach Barbara Sher once said about the work we are meant to do, that it's probably born of an ache in childhood. And here you and I are, Helene, talking about our fathers. But I remember aching for my dad that he didn't like his work. And I'm sure that was a big reason I am devoting much of my professional life to trying to open people's minds to the possibility that they might actually enjoy their days on the planet. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I'm sure subconsciously, somewhere in there, all of those years of watching my parents, it, it planted that seed in the back of my brain. It just didn't come to fruition until several years after college when I realized, oh, this is something that I can teach. And then after that, oh, this is something that I can actually do as a business. But I think subconsciously, so much of what we experience when we're growing up, it, it affects us later on in our adult lives. When you look back on your career so far, is there one moment or or even period of a few months where you thought okay now i have i've turned some kind of corner i am finally aligned and i know the path forward did you have a moment like that i i think that happens probably once a year <laughs> i always feel you know, I always feel like I am on the right path because I get up every morning loving what I do. I have a great time all day long, even on what some people would consider bad days. And yes, there's some stress here and there, but even then I still love what I do. But then suddenly I'll, I'll go to a class and three months later, something I learned in that class will hit me just the right way upside the head. And I think, oh, wow, I can start maybe doing this now, or I can tweak this a little bit and oh this is great and so it just keeps getting better and better so uh, fortunately I when I make those turns um, they're always in the right direction and so I just feel better and better about everything well that's one reason we love having you on the show are you still a sports nut yes I am I am a devoted Dallas Cowboys fan by proxy because I married into a Dallas Cowboys family. I grew up in L.A. and then now live in Texas, so after college became a Cowboys fan. I'm a huge Spurs fan. Go Spurs, go. We're in the playoffs again. I think it's 24 out of the last 25 years um, we've made it into the, the playoffs. And I follow Aggie football because I am an Aggie. How did playing sports change who you are? 
it made me very competitive. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood with all boys, so I was very much a tomboy. And I got into sports because none of the boys, surprisingly, played with Barbies or dolls or anything like that. (laughs) And I was always in competition to um, see who could be the toughest, who could be the fastest, who could not get beat up by the biggest boy. Um, So sports was always a a competition. And then once I was on a formal team, I learned a lot about teamwork and leadership. And those those are traits that I still need to use today. So sports had a, a huge impact on me. When I was reading your book, the thing that made me smile, I mean, I was still laughing about it when we went to bed. I was telling Daryl last night. It's so funny to me that you'll, you'll be sitting with a client. You, you sometimes just sit in a client's office and watch people work. Mm-hmm. And they'll be screwing around in front of you. Now, on the one hand, I think, well, that's great. They're simulating an actual day. But right. it's impossible to relate to because I am the person who, if I had a maid, would clean the house thoroughly before he or she arrived. And if I had a dishwasher, I would wash the dishes before I put them in. I can't relate uh-huh. to not being on my best behavior for a time management coach. But kudos to them, you know. Right. Well, on the one hand, I'm honored that they feel comfortable enough to not put on a show for me. So that's great. And that's part of the the prep that I send over to them before our first session. I tell them, do not straighten up for guests. I want you to act as you normally would on any other day because I need to see how you perform during the day. But the other part of it is that so many people have these subconscious habits that are ingrained. They don't even realize they're doing it. So that's part of the reason I call attention to it at the end in a very non-judgmental way. I don't want them to feel like they're being scolded, but I point out my observations. And quite a few times, they had no idea that they were doing that kind of stuff because they were working on autopilot. That is very interesting to me because (laughs) I think what you're saying is you do not tell them that they are screwing around. (laughs) Helping you find more hours in your day with Helene Segura coming up next. I'm doing what works. The entertainer John Tesh was once quoted as saying, he's really not that busy. And I was obsessed with that statement because it's John Tesh. That's one reason I was so thrilled when he agreed to join us on the show a few years ago. I was asking him to uh, explain himself. And he said, you know, I, I do my radio show. I do my concerts. I spend time with my family. That's it. I know what I want out of life and I stick to it. And I thought, okay, that's the secret to life. I bet Helene Segura would agree with that approach to life. She's the author of The Inefficiency Assassin, Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter, Not Longer. Helene, I'm going to tell you something that I have learned, and I hope it's just because I'm in transition, not because I'm destined to a life of non-productivity. But (laughs) Daryl and I have had many discussions over the past several months about the one thing that I should be doing with my professional life. And it has made me sweat a lot of other things that aren't happening a lot less. It has not, however, um, inspired a lot of progress <laughs> on that one front. Mm-hmm. The big change I've noticed is that I feel guiltier about it, <laughs> which is not um, progress. But I mm-hmm. think eventually there will have been magic in deciding what the heck it is I'm supposed to be doing with my time here on the planet, at least right now. Well, I think going back to what you mentioned about John Tesh and him saying he knows exactly what he wants, that's a big part of it. And from what you said, if you're feeling guilty about what you're doing or what you're not doing, you may not have found exactly what it is you want to do or maybe there needs to be a different way to do it. And once you discover what it is that that's your focus for your career, your business life, your personal life, 
then you're in tune and you know that that's what you should be working on and everything that you do supports either that career path or that personal path that you want to take. And that's part of the reason why John Tesh doesn't use the word busy. Um, Ernest Hemingway had a really great quote. He said, never confuse movement with action. And just because we're busy all day long doesn't mean we're doing anything productive. It just means that we're moving, we're typing, we're running around. But what is it that we are actually producing or completing? Is it better instead to have action where it's very purposeful and you are working toward that personal goal or that work goal that you want to have? Not to make excuses, let's just say I'm asking for a friend, but are people ever really afraid of success? I mean, really afraid of it. Do you feel that you're afraid of success? <laughs> that didn't work, did it? <laughs> um, no. I, I, okay, I would it. say that Go ahead. For I, I'm not afraid of, of success. Um, I think a lot of people are. Um, and, you know, it's funny because now that I think of it, my, my speaking agent, she was saying, well, you know, I, I had this client one time who was about to double his fee. He got an offer. A company wanted to pay him to be up on the stage to give the grand keynote, and he was going to make more than twice he normally would ask for, and he completely freaked out and didn't want to do it. So he was afraid of that part of success. So I guess with... Uh, Success, uh, it's what I'm driving after because I know what I want, but I'm nervous about the job that I will do once I'm asked to do something. It's that recovering perfectionist in me. So um, maybe a nervousness about success, but excited about it. I'll ask Daryl. Do you think I am? There's something going on. Did you fear success? Well, I fear something. You, you know. You <laughs> fear a lot of things. <laughs> You could fill a book, probably, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure what it is. I think you're just a little overextended, perhaps. You have too many irons in your fire. Yeah. Well, I don't want to mm. stop doing, like, this show. I love the show. I don't want to stop mm. blogging, you know. But I, mm. I, I also think, Colleen, I, I'm only now starting to get honest about what those things actually require in terms of time if I'm going to do a good job at them. Right. Well, which ones bring you the greatest joy, first of all? I, you know, I've been asking that question my whole life, and I can't, I, I like the career combo platter. We only have 30 mm -hmm. seconds in this segment, but I, I have things that I, I don't want to give up because I love them. You know, I'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, giving up a kid or something. So mm. anyway, let's switch tracks after the commercial break and talk about something that I think a lot of people can relate to, how much they should try to stick to a to-do list. That's ahead on Doing What Works. This could be the most interesting conversation you'll hear all day. Go ahead and eavesdrop. We encourage it at Doing What Works. The inefficiency assassin, time management tactics for working smarter, not longer. Don't we all aspire to work smarter? Helene Segura joins us. You can learn about her work and the book at HeleneSegura.com. Helene, I have two speeds. One, I'm out of breath trying to keep up with work. That's the speed most likely to garner respect from my business partner, Daryl. And the other speed is the one who takes everything on today's to-do list and just adds it to tomorrow's list. And that's the one most likely to endear me to my husband, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to get something accomplished, I'm kind of annoying. And if I'm like, oh, what the heck, it doesn't matter. I'm the fun mm -hmm. wife, you know, and it's, it's kind Aww. of tricky to walk that line, especially when you share an office all day with the person you're married to. Right. So is there the possibility that you could work separately so that way if you do happen to have any habits that are perceived as annoying by Daryl, that he wouldn't be able to have access to that annoyance? 
Do I annoy you, honey? <laughs> 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 yeah, ask him on the radio. That'll that'll be interesting. <laughs> oh, do you want the truth or shall I sugarcoat it? I no. want the truth only kindly. Yeah. Oh, what? Well, well, okay. Yeah. Here's the truth. Yeah. And this is not unique to us. Restricted yeah. to us yeah. or unique to us. Good way to put it. There are little things that between married couples could be considered annoyances, minor, some major, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but um by and large, nothing, you know, there are no deal breakers in there if that's what you're worried about. <laughs> well, and it, Helene, how we handle it is headphones. I mean, we, our chairs are six inches apart, but if we need to get work done and the other person has, has headphones on, it, it's almost a do not disturb sign, but not okay. really, you know. Well, do you set up break times or do you just turn around and interrupt each other whenever one has a question? Uh, we have, we, we, we do both. In other words, there are time, like, there are certain days of the week where I know Daryl is under a crush of production work on the radio shows. And I know, you know, to maybe batch my interruptions, he knows that I like to get my hard writing done generally in the mornings and he'll do the same. And then we mm-hmm. stay looser if we're just doing administrative work or whatever. So it works. Oh, Good. And because if that wasn't working, what I'd recommend is just let the other person know how long you need of uninterrupted time. So if you need a good 25 minutes to put the do not disturb sign on, please don't interrupt me unless there's an emergency because I've got to concentrate without interruption. Letting the other spouse know what your work schedule needs to be throughout the day, uh, that's really helpful. So that way that other spouse isn't bothering you because they're not intentionally trying to bother you. They're just trying to get information and they don't know that it's not a good time to be disturbed. How do you do that in an office where you don't even have a door? You just have a cubicle. How do you, how do you get time to work? I think offices are just interruption factories. Oh, most definitely. And, you know, a lot of those interruptions aren't necessarily social. There are other people who have waited till the last minute to work on something, and so they're going around asking questions or, can you help me with this, and I need that. That's why I think team meetings are extremely important, and not the kind of team meeting where you just sit there and stare at the boss who's ever in charge of the department. We're talking about a 30-minute weekly team meeting where everybody checks in with, these are the things that I need from you over the next two weeks in order for me to get this project done. So everybody knows ahead of time what needs to happen. And that won't cut the interruptions by 100%, but it will cut them down quite a bit. And it's also during this meeting that you let your coworkers know, all right, I have this big project that's due on Thursday. So on Wednesday between 10 and 12, I'm going to be hanging a little sign on my cubicle that says, please do not disturb. Because it's not like you can hang that sign up for eight hours, then you'll be seen as the department grump. But just letting everybody know ahead of time, I I really need this focused time. And then they can interrupt you outside of that window. As anyone who's ever been in a group project at school knows, though, Helene, you can't force people to do their work when they're supposed to do it, even if you give them plenty of notice. Well, how do you get around it? If they are coming up to you and asking, okay, can you please do this for me right now? I really need it. Then that's where our assertiveness needs to come in. And, and you can say, I'm really glad that you're, you're letting me know and you're communicating that you do need these items, but I have these other tasks that I need to get done. And I didn't know beforehand that you, know, you were going to need these items. So either can you help me finish these items so I can work on yours now, or can I get you these items tomorrow morning? Because then I'll have time to work on them and do a much better job. Now, if we continue to drop everything every time somebody requests something right on the spot, we are teaching them to continue to interrupt us because we will continue to drop everything. So that communication piece is really key, and you don't want to be mean about it, but you do need to let the other person know that this is how you're being affected by those last-minute interruptions. 
That reminds me of one of the stories from your book, Helene, that got to me the most. The, the guy who was so nice, he never said no. He never got on anybody for anything. And then he had a heart mm-hmm. attack. Right. Exactly. I mean, he's the sweetest guy. He still is the sweetest guy. And because he wasn't saying no, because he wasn't taking control of his time, he was letting everybody else take control of it. So by the end of the day, he's not finished with all of his work. He has to come in early. He has to work late because on top of helping everybody else, he still needs to do his work and do it well. And that just built up all of his stress, which led to having that near heart attack. And that totally changed how he perceived his day. He realized that, yes, he still wants to be nice to people, but if he doesn't take care of himself first, then he won't be able to help anybody else, let alone himself. When we come back, I want to talk about taking your phone with you so that you can keep working when you're not at work. There are lots of schools of thought on this, and... Helene, that's, you can guess where I'm going with this. That is the story in the book that got to me the most. And we'll cover it next on Doing What Works. The following is sponsored by the Knock'em Dead Career Management Books. Next is an old friend and a regular guest on Doing What Works, Martin Yate, New York Times bestselling author of the Knock'em Dead Career Books. Martin drops by now and then to share advice on challenging job search and career problems. So, Martin, at a job interview, when a hiring manager asks that terrible question, what's your greatest weakness? What do you say? We all share weaknesses. Even you and I have weaknesses, surprising as it may sound. And there's one weakness everyone on the planet shares, everyone in the professional world, and that's managing to stay current with the technology that's affecting your job and your profession. So in this instance, you start by talking about how the business is changing, the tools are changing, especially the evolving tools for productivity and how keeping up with them takes a lot of time. And then you talk about how you are doing it. Right now, I'm reading about, I've just attended a weekend workshop. I'm in my fifth month of doing, and then you talk about a certification or a course you're doing that's relative to the job. It's a great answer. Or you can talk about how productivity has speeded up and how the importance for having powerful multitasking skills are much more important to success. Did you know that multitasking was one of the most frequently used requirements on all job postings? I'm not surprised. Employers are always looking to get the most bang for their buck. I imagine this and many other tough questions are covered in your book, The Knock 'em Dead Job Interview. In the Knock 'em Dead books, we have certain building blocks on which our philosophy of job search and career management is built. And one of these building blocks is a concept of learned behaviors or what we call transferable skills and professional values and there are 12 of them and one of them is multitasking and I explain how multitasking works and it's not being pulled from one task to another it's about staying on track and keeping your priorities right and using your time effectively and if you read about it and you learn about the PDR cycle that's the plan do review cycle you can use this in your answer to an interviewer And they'll be wildly impressed about what you're doing to turn a weakness into strength because no one has enough time to do things. You admit this, you are honest about it, and you finish the answer by showing what you've done and how you're improving. For a special offer on Martin Yates' books and other job search services, visit martinyate.com and get 20% off anything in the Knock'em Dead store. Enter the promotional code WHATWORKS. Again, that's martinyate.com. Learn to control your destiny. I would like to think that Daryl and I are not the judgmental type, but we can get a little judgy now that Katie's off at school in New York. Sometimes we don't have a lot to do, but watch other parents not be good parents. <laughs> so 
that awful to admit, but we'll be sitting somewhere and there will be this adorable little kid, you know, and the parents are just both glued to their phones and sure they could both be heart surgeons, you know, corresponding about the latest surgery coming up. But we just want to grab them and say, you know, the kid's right here. You're going to miss her so badly someday. Anyway, Helene Segura joins me on Doing What Works, and she wrote a book called The Inefficiency Assassin. And one of the stories she tells in this book is about a mom who takes her phone to her kid's ball game. You can take it from here, Helene. She took the phone to the ball game thinking, oh, I can get a little extra work done now. After all, I'm here with my kids. I am spending time with them. And her son was getting ready to go to bat as an email popped up on her phone. And she saw it was from a really large, very important client. And she figured, well, I'll just answer really fast, and then I can go back to watching the game. Well, while she's typing up this email, all of a sudden, everybody just starts yelling and shouting, and she's thinking, oh, my gosh, what's going on? She hits send, and she looks up, and she realized she just missed her son's first home run. And, you know, that's not something that you can get back. And then he asked her after the game, did you see my home run? And what's she going to do? She can lie and say yes. Or she can be honest and say, no, I totally missed it. Either way, it's totally devastating to him, all because she felt like she should get a little more work in. And I meant to say this earlier in the program, Helene, about like my dad and and trying to work at a job he wasn't that thrilled about. He's got all these responsibilities. On the other hand, I mean, people need to make a living and their bosses expect them to be on call all the time. And I don't want to pretend there's an easy answer. Sometimes you do need to be available to respond to an email. It's not something that is automatically wrong just because your kid's playing ball. On the other hand, I think some of us have more latitude than we realize. That's your point, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We put a lot of undue pressure on ourselves thinking, oh, because we have this phone, we should be able to answer anybody within 30 seconds. A lot of the world doesn't necessarily expect that. And if they do, that's something you can change by setting expectations with your clients, letting them know what your work hours are, what's going to be your response time on an email. Is it half a day? Is it by the next business day? The thing about the story that you just brought up, the one about the home run, is that she wasn't being required by her boss to work. She just felt like, oh, maybe I can get this done. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it all the more troubling for her. It's not that the boss is saying, you have got to be next to your phone 24-7. This is something that she did on her own and therefore could have been totally prevented. I want to see if I can guess the single tip in your book that probably stands to help the most people besides batching email, that's sort of a separate category, turning off email notifications. Did I guess right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. (laughs) Because it's the siren call of, oh, it might be really good. Right. And, you know, our phones are like little hits of dopamine every time we reach over and we think, oh, my goodness, I get this text and somebody might like me or I get to check this email or this Facebook notification. And we're pretty much addicted to our phones because we do get that hit of dopamine. And what people don't realize is that every time we switch tasks, it takes an average of 60 seconds for our brain to restart. The average adult gets over 100 emails and texts every single day. So if you have your notification on each time, that's 100 interruptions. That's 100 lost minutes. That's 100 minutes we can get back so we can use that time to get the important things done. And I'm not suggesting that you quit checking text messages and emails, but instead you check it when your brain is ready to receive it. So if your boss requires you to check email every 10 minutes, that's fine. At least you're getting 10 minutes of uninterrupted work when you're not having that notification go off because that's so much better, that 10 minutes of solid time just focused on one thing as opposed to constantly reaching over to the computer or to your phone to go check what that dinging thing is trying to 
tell you. I think the other thing people underestimate is the the ramping up time to get back into the task. It's not just the time spent on the interruption. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a study by UC Irvine, and they were studying interruptions from coworkers, like we were talking about earlier. And what they discovered was when somebody was interrupted by a coworker, it took them up to 25 minutes to get back on their task after helping out that coworker. I mean, 25 minutes is a huge amount of time. So it's not just the time that they spent helping this other person. It's also, okay, now, now where was I? Where were these papers? What was I in the middle of? That takes up more time from the day as well. That's why there was another book, The Myth of Multitasking. The only entities that can multitask are computers, and they're not even doing it. It just looks like it because they're switch tasking so fast. Did I get that right? Yes, task switching, and computers can do that because they're programmed to. Our brains are not programmed to do that. So when we're task switching, we're losing that 60 seconds each time in between those tasks. That's why I go back to it's so much better to just focus for 10 or 15 minutes at a time, and then you can switch tasks and work on something else if you're tired of what you've been working on. And that way you're not flip-flopping, losing 60 seconds here, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth throughout that work period. When we come back, we'll help you find four extra hours. Four extra hours in every day. Is that worth hanging around for? I think it is. That's ahead on Doing What Works. Think of the person you love being with more than anyone else in the world. Just for a moment, think of it. I'm not going to be quiet during that moment because then you'll think there's something wrong with the radio. But I think most of us would describe that person as unhurried. Don't you want to feel like the person you're with has all the time in the world for you? And I am woefully, uh, what's the word, Daryl? Inadequate? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That word came to you pretty quickly. I guess that should go on the top of my to-do list, yeah. One reason I gravitate toward people like Helene Segura, who can help me with that. Helene wrote The Inefficiency Assassin, and you can learn about that book at helenesegura.com. Helene, once in a while, I'll be reading someone's book and just stop dead in my tracks. And this is what did it for me, that people spend four hours a day, in bits and pieces, granted, but still four hours a day, Social media, on social media, TV, and volunteer work. And the volunteer work portion reminded me of that thing you had in grade school, like what what thing is not like the rest? You know, I just, Mm -hmm. how do you do volunteer work in bits and pieces for starters? And I just don't see many people considering that, like, not goofing off, but, you know, you know what I'm saying there. Mm -hmm. Well, with volunteering in bits and pieces, it could be at their kid's school, and so they're stopping in and they're doing some kind of homeroom check for 15 minutes after they've dropped off the kids, and maybe at the end of the day they come back and they'll do a little more work. It might be that they go in every morning at a certain time and spend maybe 30 minutes helping out the teachers. So that's how some people divide up their volunteer time, and they don't realize, wow, you know, this is where all of my time is going. Or it could be that they're making a bunch of phone calls or they're doing errands and they're mixing it in between work and the other things in their personal lives, and they've never counted up how much time that they spend volunteering. And just as a disclaimer, I am not anti-volunteering because the world would not turn without so many volunteers. But it's important, just like with work, that we also make sure that we're using our volunteer time productively as well. Well, I think it's a great point. I'm glad you threw in that disclaimer. And it reminds me of a discussion I had with a girlfriend who felt guilty that she wasn't doing more volunteer work. I wasn't doing any. And we're like, our kids are little. We have full-time jobs. There are seasons for that, you know? Yes, yes, exactly. 
and you have to determine how much time you do have to give to volunteer work almost on a yearly basis because as your kids grow up, they have different types of activities. So one year you may have no time, and the next year, oh, maybe I can help out with this one festival. And even when you don't have kids or your kids are out of the house, you still need to determine how much time would I like to give. A lot of people, especially women, because we are inherently nurturers and we have a fear of saying no to people, we just want to say yes and take care of everyone, we don't first ask before accepting the volunteer your job, what all is involved and what is the time commitment. Or even better, I can volunteer one hour a month. What would you like me to do in that hour? So you need to look at your schedule and, and see what time you have available. For me, I prefer something that is not a long-standing commitment. So I like to do what I call one-night stands with (laughs) charities where I will go volunteer for an evening event. So I've worked with two or three nonprofits that way where I volunteer at their big gala. I provide all the help that they need, but just that one evening. So I'm not tied to this constant commitment. That's a great way to do it. We have only about a minute, and in the spirit of not being able to manage what you can't measure or what you don't measure. I think if people realized how much time they spent watching TV or updating their Facebook pages, they would quit saying they don't have enough time for the things they really love because there's the extra time right there. Exactly. And that goes back to being on autopilot. We don't realize how much time we spend on all of those entities until we become fully present and catch ourselves going down those rabbit holes. The book is The Inefficiency Assassin, Time Management Tactics for Working Smarter, Not Longer. We thank you, Helene Segura, very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. (laughs) You can learn more at helenesegura.com. And thank you very much for listening to Doing What Works. This broadcast is copyrighted by North Shore Productions. To learn more about the show, you're invited to visit MaureenAnderson.com. You can read Maureen's blog, listen to her podcast, or pass along suggestions for the program. I'm Cindy Weir. Thanks for listening, and tune in again next week for more great advice and inspiration on Doing What Works.